Welcome, life scientists, to another exciting life science lesson. What do we have in store today? If I'd say it's all about love, I'm not sure you'd understand what I mean, but we're looking at the human transport system. We're going to focus on the heart, right? That organ that we always talk about for love. So guys, what we're looking at now is we've looked at a series of mammalian tissue, right? We've looked at how water transports through a plant. And now we're going to look at how the human, all right, body needs to transport things around. And today we're going to focus a lot on this muscular structure that is called the heart. So our plan for the lesson today, all right, as I put a little thing here, you, I want you to, maybe while I'm talking, just keep doing this with your hand. Right, and, and just see how tired your heart, your hand gets. Because remember, your heart has to beat all the time. All right, it doesn't stop. So imagine while I'm talking, you take a tennis ball or something, and you just keep, right, you'll just keep pushing. What's going to happen? You're probably going to have awesome biceps and awesome, but you can't tire because if you tire and you stop, you're going to die. So the heart, we're going to look at something that needs to keep on, all right, keep on pumping all the time. What are we looking at today? All right, in our series today, we're going to look at the structure of the heart. And you're going to see there might be a little surprise of what we're going to do when we get to the heart. And the second thing we're going to look at is how does the heart beat? So we've got the structure, we've got to get things through it. And how does it simply contract and relax? As we do every time, guys, we've got a whole lot of new terminology that we're going to use. Please make sure that you are familiar with the terminology. Make sure you are familiar with the words that we use so that you are able to use them correctly. Remember, if you're not sure, go and have a look in your textbook. Go and have a look in the notes and make sure that you understand the right way in which we are going to use right, these terms. Okay, very. the first thing we're going to start off is this whole concept, right, of what a surface to volume ratio is. And what do I mean by that? What I mean very simply is, is that some organisms are really, really small, okay? And then you get some organisms that are really, really large. Now what happens is, small little organisms have a small surface to volume ratio. Which means very simply is that a lot of their things are going to be very simple. But the larger something is, we're going to need more of it. And that actually means that we're going to need more complex, and I'm going to use the word here, systems. So if I'm looking at my transport system, if I'm looking at my transport, what am I actually looking at? I'm most important thing, and there's, there's others as well, is I want to get oxygen and carbon dioxide into and out of my body. Things that are really small, little organisms that are really small, like a really simple unicellular organism, what's going to happen? Oxygen can go in and carbon dioxide can go out. Simple diffusion. Now this person is me. All right, there I am, little stick figure. I am quite big, all right, I have got this layer of skin around me, and I also am very busy, so I'm going to need to have lots of oxygen. And unfortunately, oxygen can't come into around my skin, right? I need to actually have a serious system that's going to get the oxygen into my body and around it. So that's what we're talking about, that usually the bigger an organism gets and the more complex it is, we need to have special systems in place that can do things effectively. Now, as I say to you over here, this is a little amoeba. It's a single cell and it's really small and it doesn't need to have this transport system. It doesn't need to get things around because it's really, really simple, and it's really, really small, and it pretty much can do everything itself. However, the more, the bigger we get, as I said, and the more complex we get, we are going to need to have a specific system. 
Now I want you to have a look at two concepts that we're going to have when we look at a transport system. Now over here what we have is an insect. Now if we have an insect, here is a little grasshopper, they scare me, I don't know why we put them on, but that's what we have over here. Now what we're talking about, what is a circulatory system? What do you do when you circulate? You get around, okay? You get around. That's exactly when you circulate at a party or whatever, you're going from person to person. Now what we have over here is when we talk about transport, what do we want to transport? As we said before, I want to transport carbon dioxide out of my body. I want to transport maybe oxygen into my body. What else do I need to transport? I might want to transport water, right? I might want to transport food. Now, all these things that I want to transport, I need to have a way in which they can transport. And if you have a look over here, this is what we call an open circulatory system. And it simply means that we have a little heart, a little pumping mechanism. Don't even really call it a heart. It's called an osteum. And all that it does is it just, if oxygen comes in, it just slowly pumps it up. And then all that the oxygen does is it just lines the whole body cavity over here. We don't actually have serious what we call blood vessels. When we look at the, when we look at the transport system, we're going to look at the heart, we're going to look at blood, and we're going to look at blood vessels. They're going to transport all of these things. Insects don't have that. However, the more organized, the more complex right, an organism is, we need to be able to transport things to all the cells in the body, okay, and as I said to you before, what do we need to transport? We need to get food to the different places, that's the nutrients, I need to get gases to and from, and most importantly as well, I need to get any kind of waste. So what we do over here, the more complex we have, we have this, what is called a closed circulatory system. And what do you mean here by closed? I'm going to go over here. Look here. This goes out. It doesn't close. It's open. So everything just mixes together. It's like this big mixture. However, in a closed circulatory system, you're going to have a transport system where whatever it transports is going to be restricted. Let me use a blue over here. That will be better. It's restricted to a series of blood vessel. So here we're going to look, there's a heart, and that heart is going to pump whatever it needs to transport, but it's going to stay in these vessels. It's not going to open up. It's going to get where it needs to go, it's going to do its whole thing, and it's going to come back again in these blood vessels. And if at any time it goes out, our body has to do something about it. That's how we can bleed to death. Okay, what happens? You want to make sure that the blood stays in the blood vessels because that is what we are going to use as a transport. Now, as I said to you, right, what we're going to have, what we're going to look at is the heart, the blood, the blood vessels, and a new system called the lymphatic system. But today, we're just going to concentrate on the heart. Now, guys, what is the heart? Right, very simply, take your fist, right, that's the size of your heart, and you're going to put it here on your chest slightly to the left-hand side. Now, what it is, is we have got a thorax, part of the body, and that thorax has got two major things in it. It's got two lungs, and it's got a heart. Now, that heart over there fits into a space in between the lungs. That's our word, new word that you're going to learn called the media steinum. Media, just slightly off center, steinum is another word for the sternum. So it's just slightly to the side of the sternum. Now where does the sternum come into place? Guys, our lungs and our heart are really important. So guess what we need? We need a protection. So we've got the structure called the rib cage, and the rib cage is made up of bones, and in between the bones are, are muscles, intercostal muscles, and as you can see, 
They're going to cover the heart and they're going to cover the lungs and they're going to be protected. This rib cage is also going to need to be right for the lungs to be able to breathe. So we're going to be protected by the structure called the rib cage. Now, if you have a look at the heart, we're going to, as I said, we might have a surprise for you. The heart doesn't, and the thing you need to understand about all the organs in the body, they don't just float around. They very often have this covering of connective tissue. And when you did mammalian tissue, it was areola connective tissue. And I call it like the Bourevoix layer. And what do I mean by that? I mean that you can't see it, but you know it's there. And that's exactly what the heart is. The heart has a very outer layer called the pericardium. And as I said, you will see just now in our surprise that you're going to see the pericardium very clearly. And it's in the sac. And why is it in the sac? Because the heart is going to beat. It's going to beat. It moves. Right? And when it moves, you don't want it to friction. You don't want it to knock into anything. You want it to be in its own little place. And all of that it does is it contracts and it relaxes. Okay? And that little cover just make sure that when it does that, the movement is nice and smooth and that it's protected and lubricated because there's going to be a little bit of fluid. Can you see there? Right, we've got a little bit of fluid. And what's the fluid there? For lubrication. And what do we need lubrication for? Right, to protect it from friction so that we don't have friction against the heart. We don't want to have that at all. Guys, when we look at the heart, Right, we can see that the heart has an external. This is what it looks like on the outside. And what we're going to see is a whole lot of blood vessels. And we're often going to use the red and the blue. We use red to show, there we go, hang on a second, let me do that. Oxygenated, so full of oxygen. And we use the blue to show deoxygenated. Right, and we mean by deoxygenated, we mean filled with carbon dioxide. And then we're going to have a look at the inside of the heart. And we're going to see that the internal structure, that is the inside, is made up of chambers. We're going to have top chambers. They are going to be called the atrium, all right? And we're going to have the bottom chambers, which are going to be the ventricles but you're going to have a little closer look to that just now. Okay, guys, it's time to have a short little break. We're going to be right back. Welcome back, Life Sciences. I hope you had a little bit of a stretch and just get that heart rate going. Yes, get the heart pumping, and that's what we're talking about today. We're looking at the human transport system, and today we're taking particular attention on looking at the structure, this organ called the heart. And as I said to you before, it's the size, ours is the size of a fist, and it has to, it's a muscle. It contracts and relaxes, right, constantly. Now, when we look at the heart, when we ended off in the last segment, we looked at the concept that the heart, right, has an outside and an inside part. So we're going to look at those. Just again, the, ver the words that you have to use, you're going to see, as I said, we've got a bit of a surprise for you. Make sure we use these words right and maybe identify where they are. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at the outside structure of the heart. So instead of me showing you a picture, we're actually going to go and have a look at the, the real thing. Well, Life Sciences, look what we have for you today. All right, doesn't this look so, so interesting? This is so amazing. I know some of you are running around and you think, oh, this is terrible, but what does she have in her hand? Okay, so what I have over here, I want to just I want to show you. And just before we start, I just want to make sure that you guys know this is from an ox. 
So lots of, lots of kids, people say to me, oh, is that a human? No, guys, we, we can't do that. You're not allowed to kill somebody. This is an ox, so it's a really, really, really big animal. So the organs that we're going to look today are really, really big. Yours are going to be much smaller, but we're going to see it on an awesome scale. So what am I holding in my hand over here? This is a trachea. And what is a trachea? A trachea is your windpipe. All right, and what is my windpipe? If you're going to have a look over there, it's this nice hollow tube. And this is where all our air is going to go down. As you can see, beautiful, nice and hollow. And you're going to see later on, it's got all of these, right, these lovely like, cogelaginous rings that are going to keep them open. Now attached to the trachea, whew, they are huge are these beautiful, spongy, pink lungs. Look at all this, they're nice and pink, right? When we see them all black and all gross and brown, that's the sign, those, all those smokers, or maybe some of you have got diseases of the lungs, going to see over here it's lovely if I could squeeze it it's nice and spongy and you can see over here in the bottom of the tray it is huge the lungs are ginormous and remember they flat because there's no air in them so they're going to actually if air came in it would inflate and get even bigger now this huge ginormous I don't even know the word that I could use here Right, this is the heart that we're going to look at. Now, what I'm going to do is, you can you see over here, that you can't actually see the heart yet because I'm going to have to do a little bit of cutting and snipping to get to it. But what we've got over here, this is what we call the pericardium. Now, if I were to just cut a little bit, it's the sac around the heart. I often call this the Budavos layer. And what it is, can you see here? Guys, I can't even use a scalpel. This is so big, right? Oh, there we go. I'm opening it up. Oh, there we go, the heart. This is awesome. Okay, I'm as excited, I think, as you are. Like a nice, beautiful gift that we get here. And as you can see, there we go. We're starting to see the heart more clearly. Also, what I've got, you see these over here? They've gone hard. When we got this heart, it was actually nice and warm. And this was all soft and squishy. And it's hardened because this is fat. Now, I don't know if you can remember when you did biochemistry, this is animal fat, lipids. And when it, room temperature, when it, when it, it gets out of the body, what happens? It solidifies. So if we have to feel here, right, I can see instead, instead of it nice and juicy, all of a sudden it's got hard. All right, so what we're going to do now, I'm going to take the heart, there we go, all right, out of, the, there we go, out of the sack, and then we're going to have a look at it a little bit better detail. Wow, that was now quite a bit of a mission, guys. Sure, have a look here. As I said to you, sure, the, it was a very tight fit. Look how big this is. This is the ox heart. Now, if I'm going to put it here in this tray next door to me, over here, guys, this is the size of my fist. This is the size of the human heart. All right, so there's my fist. All right, there's the, the, here's the ox heart. Wow, you can see absolutely huge, all right, difference in size. But you've got, it, it's got to make sense. The bigger the animal, all right, the more blood we have to pump, the bigger the muscle is going to be. Okay, so now we're going to have a look. Let me just oh, move these to the side over here. There we go. Right, that bled a little bit over here. So now we're going to have a look at the heart. And we're going to look at the external structure. Now when it comes to the heart, what you need to understand is it's a mirror image of it. So what am I saying is, so if I have to put the heart, say this is my heart. It goes over here. Can you notice it tilts slightly? So at the top, it's much wider because those are going to be the top chambers and the heart narrows down to an apex here at the bottom. Okay, what are all these white things you are wondering? This is going to be fat, adipose tissue. Remember when we looked at mammalian tissue as well? This is really, why do we, internal organs, they need this fat. They need it to be able to keep warm and as a shock absorber. Now, if we look very carefully, let me go over here. I don't know if you guys can have a look. There we go to zoom in over here. 
all of these over here, these are blood vessels. And what we tend to forget is that the heart needs its own blood supply. So all of these are the coronary arteries and the coronary veins. And you'll very often see that the veins are on the surface of the heart and the arteries are usually a little bit right further down, reason being arteries high pressure and we also sometimes want to protect them a little bit more than the veins do. Now if we have a look, I want to show you this top part over here. I'm going to put my finger in all of these right, little holes over here. Do you notice? These are the arteries and the veins that are going to come into the heart. So what's going to come into the heart? Right, we're going to have the superior and the inferior vena cava, the veins coming in, bringing the deoxygenated blood out. And then you're going to see this huge big one over here. It's the one I had to cut and it's so thick. It's this huge big blood vessel over here. All right, that is going to be the aorta. And if you can see it, it's very tough. If I touch it, it's quite hard, all right, because it's going to have to pump all that blood to the rest of my bodies. But what we'll do is if we, all right, if we cut it open and we put little things inside, we will be able to see, all right, what is the right and what is the left side of the heart. So when we look on the outside of the heart, right, we can't really see what the inside looks like. I know that sounds like a stupid question, all right? But we've got things on the outside. Now I want you to have a look at the top over here. At the top of my heart, can you see these little pink things? If you zoom in over here, you're gonna see this little chamber over here and this little chamber on the side over here. And what they are is the heart is also made up of chambers. We have the top chambers, they are the atria, and we have the bottom chambers, which are the ventricles. Okay, so when I cut it, as I said to you, it's not always easy to see which is the left and the right side, but what we're going to look at, the heart is at an angle. It's in the mediastinum. Well, guys, that is what the heart looks like on the outside. Not really exciting, I know, but the best part is yet to come. Now we're going to look on the inside. I'm going to cut the heart open. And when I open the heart, you are going to see some structures immediately. And they are going to be the valves. Now in the heart, as I said, the heart valves prevent backflow. And what that means is we don't want the blood to go backwards. There's no reverse. So when I cut the heart open now, when I take and look into the internal structure, as soon as I open up, you're going to see these white, stringy, flappy things. Those are the valves. Okay, back we go to the real thing. Well, guys, I've just cut it open slightly, and I want you to, to have a look. Right, when the first thing that you see when I, when I open up is these white, stringy things. Okay, obviously you can't say stringy things, but it's one of the most obvious things that we have here. And I want to show you... All right, these white things are attached to like, like flaps, and those flaps are the valves. Now remember when we look at the heart, when we look at the function of the heart, blood must pump from the top, this small little piece over here, to the bottom. And it can't just, there's no reverse when it comes to blood. It, can go, it must go top to bottom. And it's like when you squeeze your toothpaste, right? exactly the same thing needs to happen. But when it gets to the bottom here, yeah, we can't have it go back to the top. So what we have are valves. Remember, valves prevent backflow. Very important concept. Now, valves are not muscles, right? Valves are little part of like ligaments. So they're not going to be able to close by themselves. So I wonder if you can have a look at these white strings. These are called, the, the, the proper name is chordae tendinae, right? Those are tendinous cords. And that's exactly what they are. They're tendons. What does tendons do? Tendons attach to muscle. And that exactly is what the heart is. So when we look at the inside over here, why are the tendons attached to the heart? Because imagine the strings attached. And when the heart beats, it pulls down. Can you imagine? So it contracts, it pulls down. And what is attached to it? 
these tenderness cords. And those cords are going to pull down. And when they pull down, what are they going to do? They're going to open. And when they open, the blood is going to rush through it. Right? And when the blood is finished rushing through, it's going to close. And you can see those, that closing actually makes a sound. It's the heart sounds. We call it lub-dub. Okay, so these are the tenderness cords. And we're going to find them, guys, this is the lower portion. We're going to find them in the ventricles. Okay, I'm going to cut a little bit so that we can have a look at what these lower chambers are called. Guys, did you notice those valves were so noticeable? Probably the most noticeable part of the internal structure. Now, the next thing we're going to look at, when we look at the heart, right? I always draw a heart like this. The heart has a left and a right-hand side. And what we also have is a top and a bottom. Now, if I had to draw the same thing, the left side and the right side is separated by a septum. And you're going to see now what it looks like. And the top and the bottom, my top chambers, remember I have a left and a right side, are going to be called my atrium. And you're going to see now that this diagram is really kind of not in, in perspective because you're going to see the atriums are going to be really, really small. And here at the bottom, my bottom ones, my bottom chambers are going to be my right and my left ventricle. Okay, guys, back we go to the dissection and you're going to see the differences between the left and the right and the top and the bottom. They're going to be so obvious. Okay, back to our dissection. Okay, guys, so I'm busy cutting yet again. All right, I feel like a butcher here. What I want to show you, I don't want to cut too much at the top here. Let's, let's do that. I want to show you that the heart is made up of four chambers. Now, as we've said, the heart is divided into a right-hand side and a left-hand side. And I want to show you this little piece of meat over here. Okay, if we look at the heart here, I'm going to, this is a really big piece. It's difficult to always look at. This piece in the middle over here is called the septum. And what a septum does, the same as the nose, your na you have a nasal septum. This is going to separate the right from the left. I want you to have a look over here. Look here, so if I do this, this over here is the right-hand side, and this over here is the left-hand side. And you're asking me, how on earth do you do it? Now, one of the easiest ways to tell with the right from the left, so when I cut it open here, all right, these very bottom chambers, I'm gonna start at the bottom because they're so more obvious. These bottom chambers over here, can you see that? All right, they are called the ventricles. Now, they are huge. They are so much bigger than the small atria at the top. If I ask you to look at the atria, you're gonna go, Where's the atria? And you're going to be quite right, because where exactly are they? They're so, so less significant. The atria is this tiny, tiny little piece at the top here. If I flap it, it's this small over here for this. But this chamber is huge. Now, I want you to have a look. How do I know the difference, the right and the left? I want you to have a look at this muscle over here. This is the muscle, cardiac muscle, because what does the heart do? It has to contract and relax. Now, the right-hand side of the heart, you look, see here, this little piece of muscle. The right-hand side of the heart brings all the deoxygenated blood, all right, from the body. And guess what it has to do? Here's my lungs next to me here. All it has to do is pump the blood to the lungs. And you saw there how close they are together. So it just has to go a little squeeze each time. So the lesser muscle works, the less developed it is. But now let us look on the other side. Wow. All right, guys, look at this. Look at the size of the muscle on the left-hand side. So let me show you again. This teeny little tiny bit of muscle on the right Look at this muscle. Look at this. Look at the, the, the thickness of the muscle over here. I know this is the left-hand side. Why? What does the left-hand side do that's different to the right-hand side? The left-hand side gets all the blood right from the lungs. It's nice, it's fresh, and it's oxygenated. Where does that oxygen have to go? Everywhere. It's got to go to the top of my head, and it's got to go to the bottom of my toes. So how... If I want to get it everywhere, am I going to go, uh, 
little squeak, little squeak. Uh-uh. What am I going to do? I'm going to give it a huge, all right, big squeeze. I'm going to contract a lot, right? Because then what's going to happen? The blood is going to go throughout the body. So the left-hand side literally has to do more work than the right-hand side. And that is why the left-hand side is so much thicker. Now, if this is the left-hand side, I'm going to stick my finger over here, okay? Wait, let me get a pen. This is the left-hand side. I'm going to stick this pen up. All right, there we go. Do you see where the pen comes out? Okay, that is going to be my aorta. Now, I'm going to show you over here what is my aorta. This you're going to feel here, it's hard. Some of the other ones are a little bit floppy. What is my aorta? That's the huge big blood vessel coming out of the, all right, out of the left-hand side of the heart. And there's actually a few over here because as it comes out of my heart, where's it got to branch off? It's got to go to my head. It's got to go to my arms. So it's got so many of these branches. But because the heart, the left ventricle, has to squeeze so much, these blood vessels over here actually have to be very strong, right? They have to be very strong. They have to hold the pressure. Now, if I do this, if I take the right-hand side of the heart, if I stick my pen up over there, you're going to see I'm going to get to a blood vessel. Okay, now this, the right-hand side, is taking blood to the lungs. This is going to be my pulmonary artery. A for a way. Arteries go away from the heart. And this is going to take the blood away from the heart to the lungs. Now you're going to see very often when we talk about blood vessels, we say that an artery carries oxygenated blood and a vein carries deoxygenated blood. We can't say that, okay? That's why we don't usually use that definition because this artery carries deoxygenated blood to the lungs. It's the only artery that does. So the definition for an artery is away from the heart. Okay, so when it comes back to the heart, those are going to be my pulmonary veins, the only one that's going to take it. So guys, when it comes to the internal, here we have, we know this is the right hand side. Here's my right atrium, my top chamber, my right ventricle, all right, at the bottom chamber, then if we look on this side over here, all right, we can cut it out for you. Here we go. Let me cut, do a little bit of, let me use these scissors. can cut this side a little bit more. Okay, can you see these beautiful, I'm going to cut them. It kills me to cut them, but I'm going to kill, cut these tendons. All right, I'm going to cut them. All right, and there we have, as I said to you, if I close it, those are the atria chambers, and these lower ones over here, this is going to be my left ventricle. So this is my left atrium, this is going to be my left ventricle. And as I said to you, they are separated in the middle by the septum. Wow, well, guys, wasn't that awesome? I had a really good time up to my elbows in blood, but that was fabulous. I think I need to have a, a quick little break. So do you guys, we'll be right back. Welcome back, Life Sciences. Did you really enjoy the practical? I really did. It was really awesome to be able to show you that and to realize the size of our heart compared to the size of the ox heart was really difficult to work with. So now we've looked at the structure of the heart, but how does it beat? How does it work? How does the heart right, contract in a rhythm? Now, when you looked at the mammalian tissues, when you looked at cardiac tissue, I hope you realized that the tissue had bridges. And as I say to, say to my classes, those bridges mean the cells were in contact with each other. And when a cell's in contact with each other, it can keep rhythm with one another. And that's exactly what we want the heart to do. It's all about keeping a rhythm. And that is why we're going to refer to it as the cardiac cycle. 
A cycle is a pattern that's constant and that always is the same. And if it isn't the same, that could mean that there is a slight problem. Okay, so let's have a look what we mean by cardiac, all right, the cardiac uh, cycle. Here there's quite a few words that you really need to know. And the one is asystole, which means contraction, and another is diastole, which means to relax. So generally when we talk about the heart contracting and relaxing, we actually give it a term. Systole to contract, diastole, you know, oh, such a diastole day, die, right, I'm relaxed. That's the kind of concept that we're going to look at. So guys, as I said to you, we're going to look at this concept, right, of a sequence. Now, a sequence means a pattern. And the heart is a muscle, and a muscle can only do one of two things. It can contract, and it can relax. Muscles are very simple. That's all they're going to do. They're going to bring about movement. Now, obviously, this movement is really important, but what it does is it's a pump. What does a pump mean? A pump is a driving force behind something to get something around the body. And what we're going to do is we're going to have blood. This heart is going to take our transport. The way we transport things is in this tissue that we call blood. And the heart is going to be the pump behind it. Right, so pumping, squeezing. And when I squeeze, something's going to happen. I'm going to move things along. Now, as I said to you, it's very important that you understand that there's the cycle. Now, when we talk about the cycle, I need you to understand another thing, that the right-hand side and the left-hand side, this is going to be the left, that is going to be, all right, the right-hand side. Let me go this way. Sorry, I need to be a mirror. There we go. Right, left. It's a mirror image of each other. So when I talk about the heart, you need to understand that the right-hand side and the left-hand side are going to work together, even though they might carry different kinds of blood. Now, I want you to imagine the first thing is the heart relaxing, just relaxes. And when it relaxes, I'm going to write this, blood must come in, it must go to the top, goes go to the bottom, and it just go out. Always remember those three. In, top, bottom, out. And when my heart relaxes, the blood flows into the top chambers, into the atria. It's relaxed, right? And it can just flow in. Then what happens is I need to get it from the top to the bottom. So how do I do that? I've got a muscle. So how does a muscle work? A muscle squeezes. And what's a word for squeezing? Have a look here. Squeezing is systole. So when, now have a look. So if I take the atria and I squeeze it. So imagine I take the top part and it's like a balloon and I squeeze it or your toothpaste, all right, in the morning. So I squeeze it. Where is the blood going to go down? from the top to the bottom. Now you guys saw those awesome cords, those tenderness cords with their valves. So what happens is when the atria squeezes open, the blood rushes into the ventricles. And what happens is these valves, my tricuspid and my bicuspid valves, they must open. Because what does the blood do? It rushes into the ventricles. Now, as it finishes rushing, what happens? Those valves must close. And we're going to see just now, we can actually hear them. So now, guys, now let's have a look at this one. So now I've got everything. Let's go back here. Remember what we're following. Let's go back. In, top, bottom, out. So this is in. Let's go over here. This is top. And where is it taking it to? The bottom. So our next slide is going to be, where is it? It's in the bottom. So where's our next thing after that? It must go out. So how do I get it out? It's in the bottom changes, chambers, the ventricles. So what do I squeeze? I squeeze the ventricles. 
But when I squeeze the ventricles, the blood goes out of the heart. On the left hand side, it's going to go to the aorta, all the way around the body. And on the right hand side, it's going to go to the lungs, right via the pulmonary artery. And what happens again? There are valves over here that will open. When the blood is finished, they're going to close. And when it makes a closes, it again makes a sound. Now, guys, when we're talking about all of this, I want you to have a look. Most of these things, 1, 0 0.8 seconds. 0 0.8 seconds. That's how quick each time it's going, right? That is really, really quick. Try and time it. Remember when we were younger, we used to have a stopwatch. We used to see how fast we could go in the lowest that we could do it. 0 0.8 seconds is really, really fast. And your heart is doing that all of the time, all right? Constantly all of the time. So that is called the cardiac cycle. It happens all the time. In, top, bottom, out. In, top, bottom, out. There's that pattern, that cycle that goes. And when each time that I have to get it somewhere, my heart must contract. Systole, relax, diastole. Systole, diastole, the cardiac cycle. Now, as I've said to you very often, I'm sure you've all seen all, like, all of these things on the, um, on the TV. And basically, what it means is when your heart contracts and when you relax. So the atria, when they contract, a little bit of a pressure. But did you remember when you saw the dissection, how big and thick, right, the ventricles are? Huge, big, thick, and that causes this huge, big pressure that we see. And that's why the doctors, right, take your heartbeat, because it needs to be in a rhythm. So what happens if it's not in a rhythm? That could tell me something about the heart. Now, guys, as I said to you, the heart, if you put a stethoscope here and you hear a sound, lub dub, lub dub. Those are the valves closing. So each time the valve closes, lub dub, lub dub. Right? So those semilunar valves and those valves that we saw in our dissection, they open, close, make a sound. And that gives us our heartbeat, the heart sound. And that's how we can hear the sounds. And again, the sounds, what do you think the doctor listens to? He's looking for a rhythm. He wants to see this constant rhythm. Now, the last thing we need to look at is <laughs> the heart pumps. Muscle can't just pump, right? Can't just do work. Muscle needs to have a messenger. Now, if we have a look at the heart, and we couldn't really see it in the dissection, if we have a look at the heart, the heart, right, any kind of muscle needs to be stimulated by a nerve. So guys, the heart is electrical, because what are nerves? Electrical. So when my heart stops beating, do you see sometimes they put those paddles on? What are they putting through? Electricity. And that electricity gets the heart going. So basically what happens is the following. At the top of the heart, you've got a little bundle of nerves called the SA node. Another word for it is pacemaker. So imagine some of yours, if it doesn't work, they put a little pacemaker in your heart, which is a little battery thing that fires, right, and gets the heart going. So when this nerve works, it says, contract. Can you see that? It sends a message, and what contracts? The atria contract. And that's the first thing that happens. And then the next message, it goes to the next bundle over here, called your atrioventricular node between the atrium and the ventricles. And it says to them, okay, guys, it's like a domino thing. One touches and the whole thing goes. The ventricles must now contract. So the nerves go all the way around the ventricles. And what does a nerve cell do? It tells the muscle what to do. And the ventricles contract. Do you see that? And then it goes back and it tells the atria to contract. The atria tells the ventricles to contract. So what happens is the heart is what we call autonomic. The heart tells itself what to do. The brain actually doesn't tell the heart to beat. The brain actually only tells the heart 
how fast must I beat? And that's very often when you see somebody, they say, is brain dead. Their brain is not working, but their heart is still working. Okay, and as I said there, that's where we're going to have a look at it, right here in our medulla oblongata, right over there in our medulla oblongata, right in our brainstem. That's going to say to us, listen here, all right, you need to beat faster or you need to be slower. It's like after I've run and I need to get all the oxygen around, it's going to tell my heart what to do. Okay, guys, I hope you really enjoyed the dissection today. I really enjoyed it. That's all we're going to do for today. I don't think you'll be able to get the picture of the heart out of your mind, but I'm glad you have this lovely visual. Until next time, cherry bye.